I'm about to interview an SEO that wrote one of the best SEO case studies I've ever read. His name is Corey Tugberg. He first came on my radar when I saw this article he wrote for OnCrawl, or should we be calling it a white paper or even a thesis? I ended up tweeting about it and it picked up a ton of traction. Why? Because Corey's strategies challenge the typical SEO knowledge that people take for granted today. I found his article so interesting, I ended up hiring Corey to have a chat with my team so we could further understand his approach and strategy. And since then, I've invited him to my private SEO testing group, and we've all benefited since. Now, I won't waste any more time, so let's jump into the interview. And as you watch, if you're getting any knowledge bombs out of this, why don't you drop a bomb on that like button? And if you have any questions, go ahead and fire them away in that comment box. Let's get started. Corey, brother, thanks for sitting down with me. Um, if, for those who haven't met you before or anything like that, why don't you give us a brief introduction to who you are, where you're from, and what kind of SEO you do these days? Okay, and first of all, thank you for inviting me. My name is Koray Tuberkuluf. I am from Turkey, and actually I'm in the industry like six years. And uh, actually I define myself as a holistic SEO because I don't focus on just one vertical. I focus on multiple verticals like off-page or semantic SEO or local SEO and etc. And I have created my own agency like uh, eight months ago. Now I am educating my own team and that's it, I guess. Cool. So <laughs> you, it's, inter it's interesting because when I saw the power of what you're able to pull off with your test cases, I thought, man, this guy needs to be an affiliate SEO. He, this guy's going to break the money. I, I'm curious to why you chose agency and how you're liking it. Actually, <laughs> actually, I guess you already know that, but uh, SEO consultancy is really hard because uh, communicating all the time is not uh, is not easy. And uh, actually, I didn't choose the affiliate because I like creating SEO case studies. It was the first motivation for me and uh, like one year ago or something like that I have given a promise to myself I said that I will create 10 SEO case studies at least 10 maybe after 10 I can start affiliating or something new but also in the past I was in the cas casino industry online casino industry and affiliate marketing a little bit and it was another adventure for me also sure things changed I mean and then I have started to become a kind of uh, SEO consultancy. Sure, sure. I mean, if you've done casino, then you've definitely been an affiliate before. And that's interesting. I, I, I like what you say about case studies, because if you're into doing case studies, affiliate's not the right place because you can't really yes, talk because about you can't pub Yes, you can't, you can't publish what, you've done, what you, have, you, you have done in the affiliate marketing because all of your competitors will read everything. Even if you right. hide most of the things, uh, if you hide things, the SEO case study will be like a shallow definition. You know, you, 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 if you can't show the real magic, you shouldn't write it at all. But at the moment, I can write everything in my SEO case studies. And, and I, I like it because I know that maybe four years later, I will look my back and I will see these SEO case studies and it will be fine for me. It is something uh, satisfactory for me. Yeah, that's cool, man. And your case studies are quite good. And that's the whole reason I got attracted to meeting <laughs> with you and um, doing this interview in the first place. So we'll get to that very shortly. How many clients do you have right now? Uh, it's more than 20. Sometimes I, I forget the number, to be honest, because uh, most of the things are on my shoulders. And because of the situation, I have hired more employees. And at the beginning, I thought that employees will will save time but it doesn't like, ha happen like that and at the moment it's even harder uh, and i am learning lots of new things because seo is another thing but managing a team is another thing and uh, accountant being an accountant and also doing everything for an agency is another thing business and seo are quite different and i am learning it uh, in this year yeah getting into the business side of things that's interesting so yeah. What is your background like before you were doing SEO? Like, what's your education and what's that whole history like? Yeah, uh, I am graduated. I am graduated from the Udipa University. It's in the Turkey, uh, a kind of nice university actually. And uh, I am, I have majored in advertising. Uh, I don't know the English name exactly, but it's like advertising and communication design or something like that. But it's basically marketing. And uh, I thought that I will become a kind of author, to be honest. I thought that I will write books, I will write novels, and etc. 
And then one day I was at the gym and uh, on my last year, actually things a little bit changed and one of my friends uh, approached me and he, he told me that there is something called SEO. And I thought that it is something like uh, hydrogen or oxygen or something like that. I thought that it's a kind of element from the chemistry or biology, something like that. And I asked him, what's it, what's it? Is it related to the science or something like that? Actually, this is related to the science. Level, but <laughs> and uh, later he he was also another black at SEO, by the way. He told me that we, we have lots of websites and we are switching them. We are linking them to each other and we are making money. So I thought it's fun. And actually, I have started with a little black hat thanks to him. That's interesting. <laughs> There's two interesting things that I picked up there. First is you're the first person I've ever heard of that's learned about SEO the first time at the gym. Of all <laughs> I, I, I normally don't run into SEOs at the gym. Um, second is that you started off as a black hat SEO. That's pretty similar to my experience. I, I kind of don't, I feel like not many people start off and say like, let's do the dirty stuff right off the bat. I just yeah, kind of yeah. feel like if you started six years ago and I started you know, a little bit before that, it could just mean we were just doing what worked at that point in time. And now Definitely. things change and we're doing different yeah. stuff. It's, we probably still would be doing black, black hat if it still worked. You know? so Definitely. Just Definitely. Actually, uh, why, yeah, why it wasn't my first choice. <laughs> and uh, I had to implement that. But uh, in the old times, when I started SEO, uh, we had some PBMs. Uh, imagine that you are starting you. It's your first day as an SEO and you have a PBN, you see all of the dirty stuff and there were another, other things like uh, href link on the sitemaps. We were sending new sitemaps for other third party websites and there are sudden traffic increases when you send lots of traffic to a website from multiple IP addresses like Popes, etc. Everything was going nice actually in the Black Hat SEO and when I told someone from a kind of SEO agency, from someone from the Whitehead area. They were normal people and they didn't know all of the things, but they have skills for PowerPoints, you know, they, they prepare lots of PowerPoints for the clients with lots of uh, blah, 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 you know, you know, the agencies, normal agencies, they always prepare something in the PowerPoint. And uh, personally, I hate PowerPoints. I hate PowerPoint uh, reports or something like that. And I don't prepare any kind of PowerPoint thing for my clients because it doesn't work actually. In Istanbul, at least, most of the agencies, they like talking fancy. They, they usually show fancy things to the clients and they try to stall the client with their corporate identity. But in the Black Hat, it's not like that. You need to create real results and you need to create them really quickly. It's, it's also... I think really interesting to start off as a black hat because you your mentality shifts instead of I should only be doing what they're telling me to do it shifts to I'm going to do what works and what I can get away yeah, with definitely. and if you carry that forward through your whole SEO career I think you get better results it just just, definitely. just being straight definitely. okay so now that we understand who Corey is where you came from how you learned SEO at the gym I'm just kidding um how, can you tell us a high level overview, maybe a one to three sentence overview on your thesis and your your whole understanding of topical authority and the article okay. that attracted me to you? Okay, I will try to keep things simple <laughs> because it's normally like a little bit theoretical stuff. But topical, topical authority is actually having a kind of authority for certain types of entities and certain types of phrases. If a website or if a source uh, on the web if this source has lots of articles but not just uh, the count is not the key there actually the information or the answers for specific questions are the keys there if you have lots of uh, information for a specific topic on a source after a point google will start to see you a kind of authority for this specific topic and uh, queries or phrases for this specific topic and because of this situation, actually, uh, I, I, I have created uh, actually other types of SEO case studies too, but with the, with the semantic SEO and topical authority, I didn't publish them yet. But uh, actually, it works slowly uh, after 
it depends on the client but after three or four months you will see you will start to see gradual increment increases in your traffic so it's basically uh, writing for the same topic with multiple perspectives and in a detailed way let me try to echo this back to you in the way that i understand it and maybe with an example and i always use this example and i even use this in the call that i have with you uh, protein powder. Let's say, let's mm -hmm. say I want to be an authority okay. on protein powder. So you're saying the topical authority method would be not just to write a single article on protein powder, but all the derivative articles that could be discussed related to protein, maybe absorption, whey protein, vegan protein, yes. everything. And once you cover a certain amount of coverage of this topic, Google just says, this guy's the number one on protein he's going to rank for everything re regarding it yes actually I'm right yes okay. definitely you are right because uh, for instance for the protein powder or the for the amino acids or for the uh, protein uh, simply there are lots of related entities and there are lots of related questions and also there are lots of related phrases with within a kind of hierarchy and if you create a a kind of optimized taxonomy and also a kind of optimized ontology uh, for the protein powder and if you use proper internal links and if you use a proper size structure with proper information after a point you will have lots of features and tests lots of people also ask questions and lots of best ranks actually sure and what i liked about your case study is that you were explaining this idea of topical authority but it wasn't just here's a bunch of uh, patents and here's my theories and here's my mm -hmm. uh, examples of how I think it'll work. You actually illustrated the whole thing with a case study. Can mm -hmm. you speak a little bit to the results that you got on those case studies? Yeah, of course. Uh, actually, I have tried the same methodology for uh, four different websites. And also, I, I didn't use any other kinds of SEO based practices. I didn't use links or I didn't use technical SEO. I didn't, we even didn't have a kind of proper server and we have lost the server because of the excessive amount of traffic. And also, uh, to be honest, I even didn't open the uh, search console or Google search console. I didn't check any kind of traffic data. I just keep going. <laughs> I just keep publishing uh, other articles. And uh, to prove that it's it works, I I have excluded all of the SEO best practices. I even didn't write titles. I didn't write descriptions. I even didn't use canonical text for the half of the way. I didn't use airplane text. And uh, I didn't use a header menu or footer menu. There was just main content there. <laughs> and uh, also, the, the, there is no brand power. There is no historical data. All of the domains uh, basically were new. Some of them were... Uh, some of them are like one year old, are one year old, but uh, there will, there was no content. It was an empty site. And uh, first, actually, I told the client that we we will need this amount of writers, like ten or fifteen, and most of them are fired uh, during the process because if you if you want to implement uh, semantic SEO, finding the right people is really important because it's really hard. To be honest, you need to pay attention for every sentence in a way. And I have created a topical map. And then I have created lots of content briefs. And you have seen some of them already. And then I audited the uh, authors. Then we have published the, uh, these articles. And after two or three months, Google started to see the source as an authority. And after a point, everything was like that. And we have... I think from zero, I it was like uh, three, three hundred thousand and fifty thousand uh, organic traffic per month, like in six months, from That's zero crazy. to uh, something like that. And there were four different sites, and this is this is just uh, one of them actually. The three other websites were they they are also successful and they are continuing to grow. That's awesome. I have to ask, like. I know you were excluding a whole bunch of stuff because you wanted to illustrate a point of this working or not. Were your, were your customers like, bro, why don't we have a nav bar? Actually, the client, uh, they, they like me really. I also, I like them to be honest. And 
uh, we have a, a little history with them and they trust me and okay. it's something important and also sometimes I am a little bit strict about my strategy if I tell something to my client I expect them to listen to me so mm. it wasn't it wasn't so uh, problematic for us but sometimes they they a little bit uh, sometimes they were skeptic to be honest because it was new uh, you know even the server is collapsing and <laughs> everything is uh, tearing apart it was like a kind of wood ship on the atlantic ocean <laughs> and okay. it was successful interesting and uh, i know in these case studies you avoided link building as well so you got these results without backlinks but is there is mm -hmm. that is that something with your strategy you don't build backlinks or you just this is part Not of the uh, in normal conditions i i use link building of course but for yeah. the semantic seo i didn't do that because uh, i know that i didn't need it actually to be honest and uh, beside the uh, link building also i didn't implement any kind of pace optimization or any other types of thing to be honest even the sitemap uh, has arrived later so even I didn't use a proper sitemap, and when I when I have written the SEO case study, to be honest, uh, there were lots of new articles uh, that are not indexed yet. So basically, uh, like thirty percent or thirty five percent of the articles are not indexed uh, when I uh, I have written the uh, case study. It's wild. It's wild, man. Thank you. Would you say that this topical authority strategy works in any niche? Actually, it is a universal factor uh, for a structured search engine. <clears throat> if if I need to give a little bit uh, theoretic information, uh, because this is highly uh, advanced SEO topic, to be honest, uh, there are different types of search engines. For instance, there are lexical search engines, social search engines, hypertextual search engines, and also there are entity-oriented uh, search engines. And entity-oriented search engine might have different names on different sources. For instance, some people call them as structured search engine, some people call them as uh, understanding search engine, and some people tell that it's actually a semantic search engine. Because a semantic search engine actually uses uh, natural language processing for understanding the human language. And they extract the entities, but not just the entities, also they are extract extracting their attributes and their information and also their related and possible questions. And also a semantic uh, search engine can control or audit the accuracy of the content. If you, uh, for instance, if you tell that, do we have alien DNAs or something like that? Usually I am against this type of things, but if you write lots of bullshit in your content, semantic search engine can understand that, but a lexical search engine can't. So mm -hmm. basically, topical authority is actually a universal factor because Google is also a semantic search engine and it can understand what you write there. And also, uh, if, you, if you start to become a kind of authority for your own niche uh, with every possible query, with every possible question, and if you have always a kind of related answer, a useful answer, after a point, you will have a, a really nice ranking boost, to be honest. Nice. Okay. All right. Well, let's dig into this strategy and get into the hairy details, if you will. As I okay. understand it, the, it seems to me like the most important part of this process is creating this topical map, as you call it. Yes. In other wor worlds, like in, in the world that I normally in, we call it a content plan. But I like, I like the way you illustrate it as a topical map because it is interconnected with interlinking and, and whatnot. Yes. Now, can you, one of the biggest questions I had was first, how to generate a topical map and how to do it at scale. So I can see nope. how it's the most important part of this process. Definitely. Can, can you explain uh, what is a topical map and why it's so important? Okay. So uh, first of all, a topical map is actually a kind of map that shows how entities are connected to each other. And uh, if we give a kind of concrete example, I think it will be easier for people to understand it. And let's say history about politicians, okay? Just let's say it's about actually politi politicians or singers or uh, movies, etc. If the source is about movies, but if the source is about uh, a little bit e-commerce or a little bit about... Uh, 
Elk da var money or price thing. You need to change the topical map context. So first of all, you need to choose your context. After that, you need to start to choose your entities. For instance, if, if it is about movies, you need to start with uh, act actors, actresses or uh, directors and also the most important movies. And you need to create a kind of clusters uh, for every column like movies, actors, actresses or I don't know, directors, etc. And then you need to start to uh, ask questions, to be honest, like maybe best movies maybe worst movies maybe different movies interesting movies and you can also choose the dates like best movies from 50s best movies from 60s and also you can connect all of these uh, topics to each other and if it is about uh, i don't know if, if it is about project management for instance you can uh, connect project management also uh, to the quality management or time management so basically, uh, you should have a little bit information about the topic to create a topical map. And you should show all of the possible connections between the entities. And if you don't have a proper uh, topical map, probably you will end up diluting your context. If it is about just movies, continue with the movies. But sometimes even my employees, sometimes I see them, they are changing the context and you should start to think a little bit like search engine. If you if you think like an ordinary human, ordinary editor, uh, for instance, you will dilute the context. But uh, for my SEO case studies, I always uh, stayed uh, on the same context, and it was English learning, nothing else. So I didn't uh, write about the similar languages to English. I just read, write about uh, English words, English adjectives, English, etc., etc. Interesting. So as I understand it, it's about, let's say we're targeting movies. It's about understanding what's your main source topic and then mm -hmm. what are these subcategories underneath it? And then yeah. defining those down into further subcategories and making this whole map of everything that it takes to talk about movies, which yeah. is pretty straightforward for movies. Like everyone understands movies. And you, you have your genres of horror, yes. you have Definitely. mystery, murder, action, all this kind of stuff. But what if someone were getting into a niche they've never gone into before? Maybe it's, um, like you said, um, property management or mm -hmm. some, something like uh, some kind of training or whatever. And you've never been in that niche before. How would a beginner begin to make a topical okay. map for something they just don't know off the top of their head? It's like, what kind of... What kind of strategies, like what kind of tools would they use? How would they define all okay. these subcategories? Actually, I have a kind of video for that uh, from the last week. I am educating a kind of uh, SEO, a kind of, uh, I can tell that it's he's a friend. And I have created a topical map in 15 minutes, actually. And I didn't have any kind of idea about the topic. But there is a there is a uh, working methodology for that. First of all, uh, even if you don't know the topic, you know how to ask questions. And uh, the first thing is actually starting asking the questions. And for instance, let's say that it's about quantum physics. I, I, I literally know nothing about the quantum physics, to be honest. But I know that it's type. It's about science. And uh, the entity type is something that you can start with. If it is about science you know that it also has a kind of inventor, right? And also you know that it's, uh, it has some, uh, some kind of uh, hierarchy. You know, if there is quantum physics, there should be other types of physics too. And you can start to ask differences between these physics types or etc. And you can ask about the most famous uh, scientists about the quantum physics. So first step is actually starting uh, asking questions. Just ask the questions, write them, uh, write them into the, a kind of Google Sheets document or something like that. And after that, uh, after writing the, all of the questions, start searching uh, them on the Google and take the best results and extract all of the entities from these results and then ask questions again and write these questions too. And then go to the any kind of tool, to be honest. Uh, sometimes I use uh, Keyword Cupid for that. Sometimes I use Inlinks. 
uh, for extracting entities sometimes and also HFs, SEMrush or any other types of tool might help you for creating a kind of topical map. But usually uh, asking questions, extracting entities and searching these entities and taking documents and extracting entities again and asking questions again. So basically I can tell that just ask the questions like your users. Sure. The, what I picked up from our call was, and I asked this probably a hundred times in our call because we're doing things at scale and we want mm -hmm. to be able to be able to train someone who's not necessarily an SEO expert to do these kind of things. So tools are, are great for us. And you showed us some tricks with, um, you know, like Ahrefs has like a questions uh, yes. section when you do like keyword explorer, I think it is that they have like the, mm -hmm. the different mm -hmm. questions that it scrapes. We also have people, people also yes. ask and um, answer the public. And then um, the people also ask from the Google search result is pretty interesting. Combining that with SEO menus yes. and then scraping hundreds of those, you see what entities, which topics show up there, then you start That's to scrape it. those. And That's so also, we've, been really, we've been really going down the rabbit hole of trying to automate this. And, and I know you highly believe on doing this manually, but um, yes. I'm, we're getting pretty close to automating it. And you mentioned keyword Cupid. So once you get hundreds and thousands of these different possible questions and topics to ask, Keyword Cupid does a pretty good result of taking all these topics and then sorting them into yes. similar clusters. So um, I definitely want to show this to you afterwards and see what you think of it. I think it's a decent 80-20, to be honest, but we'll it see. It might be actually, yes, it might be. And uh, actually, I am supporting the manual way. Uh, maybe it's it might be a little bit unique situation because uh, at the beginning of this process, to be honest, I was slow uh, to create a topical map. I was spending like two or three hours, but now it's like two hundred minutes or something like that. It's a little bit about the experience, I guess. But uh, also, any kind of automation can uh, might skip some kind of context context between the subtopics. Because uh, there might be some contexts that any kind of tool uh, might not understand or any kind of tool can skip easily. But as long as the automation uh, can handle the 80%, it's great to be honest because you will save lots of time. Sure. In something I picked up after what you just said is it's you you want to avoid automation because it could miss one single node in this topical map and that could be bad for you right mm -hmm. another thing that i i picked up from you is it, and this is something i tweeted from your original article how you'll write for you'll write a page you'll write an article on something that has zero search volume and that's yes. just to complete this topical map can yes. you expand more on that because that's that's just mind blowing for more most seos <laughs> most seos wouldn't bother <laughs> with make, making a page that will never get traffic thank you so uh, actually behind this idea, there are lots of theories or theoretical information for, from Google Patents too, but for uh, our audiences, I, I won't bother them and I will just uh, keep the thing simple. But uh, in a topical map, uh, everything might not be popular. And even if people don't search for something, it doesn't mean that it's not necessary actually. Because uh, sometimes even the news sites, I see this situation. If uh, any, if if a URL or if a web page doesn't take any traffic, usually we delete that, or usually we uh, redirect it to another article. And it's the right practice. I, I agree with that. But uh, if you do this to for the semantic SEO, be sure that it's not also necessary for the topical map, because in Google's own brain. Uh, or in Google's own memory, there is a specific entity for that point. And you might need to write it, just complete that point. And because if you complete that, you will be the, a kind of unique information source for the search engine. And from that point, you can generate a kind of authority, a topical authority. And also, uh, again, a little bit from the Google patent, but I know that Google has something like Google agent. They describe it like that. They choose particular people to track actually on the search engine result pages for particular topics. This is from an another theory from the Google uh, search engine patent writers actually. And uh, if they find that if a source 
is writing more unique information than other sources for unique entities, they say that this might be a better choice for the search engine result pages. And it was actually coming from there. And uh, I have written lots of articles like that, to be honest. And whenever I write something like that, for that specific entity or that for that specific query, I have seen that search engine has refreshed all of the uh, search engine result page, actually. <clears throat> Let's say that there is one article and the search volume is really, really uh, like close to zero. If you are the only one uh, who writes about that, search engine might choose you as a kind of root of that search engine result page. They put you to center and they try to organize everything from you. And also, I even see that they generate people also ask questions from your documents. So basically, uh, most of the people, I think they already know that, but people also ask questions actually are not asked by people. They are generated by the search engine from the documents. It's like it's a simple query, uh, question generation process from the articles. And uh, I see that search engine started to generate questions from my articles because there was not another article who talks about these entities before. That's super interesting. And I, <laughs> and I've seen this, as you pointed out, um, I think it was either WebMD or Healthline has like 300 articles just on apples, right? Yes. Yes. So you search apples and guess who you find there and yes, definitely. Doing so. Definitely. Actually, uh, for creating a topical map, you can scrape your competitor sitemap, to be honest. Just take their sitemaps and uh, you will see that actually how they write, how often they publish an article for a topic. And also you will see that what they focus most. And as you said, uh, helpline, I also uh, my fitness pal, for instance, I have published a kind of comparison between uh, my fitness pal and healthline they they have completely different mentality for the content publishing by the way healthline is writing more than 3000 words for every article at my fitness pal is like 300 just just 300 words and actually healthline has a better average position to be honest <clears throat> than the uh, sorry the my fitness pal has a better average position than healthline but healthline has I think millions of keywords, <laughs> unlike the My Fitness Pal. But uh, the thing that I want to say is that uh, My Fitness Pal has more than 4,000 recipes just for eggs, just for eggs, and they they have every kind of uh, nutrition fact about eggs, and they have every kind of article for egg types or any kind of egg food egg recipe and they they rank them all in a good way actually <clears throat> ridiculous one, yes one thing that one th one kind of maybe this is a potential drawback to this approach of topical authority is overdoing the amount of work that it might take to rank in a niche let's <clears throat> go back to this apple example and let's say someone's trying to rank for best apple cider vinegar and they have like their e-commerce store mm -hmm. and they sell apple cider vinegar or something mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. then they map out, they look at Healthline, they see, okay, I have to write 350 articles on apples to compete <laughs> in this niche. But I, I think from, from an affiliates or, or typical SEOs perspective, they would probably write their pillar article first and mm -hmm. then they'd start to write other supporting articles one by one, and then maybe they get there after the 15th or the 25th article. Mm -hmm. So I can see how that being is much more efficient than just saying, okay, topical yes. map, 500 Apple articles. Do you see this as a potential drawback? Actually, uh, not like the drawback uh, because uh, still for a small niche, actually you still have a context. It's really, small context and for a, a small context or small subtopic you will need a smaller topical map uh, so you you don't have to write about apple trees or apple juice and etc uh, or apple dna as uh, as i mean but still you might need to uh, complete your uh, topical map for your subtopic and uh, also uh, there is something uh, called as topical granularity. So if you have certain amount of 
possibilities. If you if you have lots of authors, if you have a big budget, it's not a problem. You can create the most detailed topical map. But if you don't have enough budget or if you don't have enough time, to be honest, you can create a little bit more shallow topical map, and you then you will need to skip some sub contexts or some uh, intermediary sections in your topical map. But still, you will need uh, more comprehensive content because you will skip lots of sub context in this uh, example. I hope sure. it was understandable. Yeah. yeah, I get that. So I'm going for apple cider vinegar. I make a topical map out of apple cider vinegar, vinegar <laughs> not apples. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's about discipline and knowing here's my lane. This is what I need to cover rather than just the whole. Yes, actually, because level it's. Above. Because it's actually a different entity. It's actually a tool, a kind of technologic tool. And also you will need to write about a little bit recipes. So uh, that's why I actually I'm saying that the context is really important. If you choose the context wrong, probably you will end up uh, with wrong topical map. And uh, also they people can check about the Google's own natural language processing API because uh, in their NLP API, they have lots of different contexts and subcontexts for the contents. And if you check this uh, subcontext, they just don't say, okay, this is about art. Okay, this is about uh, movies. There are lots of details there. They, they, they can differentiate uh, a movie from a, another type of, type of movie, or they can tell that this is about movie prices, this is about movie criticism and this is about something else, maybe movie directing and other things. And all of these contexts are actually different from each other. Very interesting. But one thing that I got from your article is that you mentioned that topical authority isn't just a function of covering the topical map, but it's also a function of how long you've been covering the topical <clears throat> map. Can you Definitely. explain that in simple terms? Of course. Uh, actually, I usually think like, I actually try to think like a search engine when I try to use search engine optimization. So basically on the web, there are billions or maybe trillions of sources. And if a source is good for today, but if it disappears next week, it doesn't mean that it's authoritative, even if it has lots of content on that specific topic. Because a semantic search engine, and especially Google, actually, they love consistency. So you need to good you need to be good for every day, every week, every year, not just one day or one week. So even if you create a kind of strong topical map for today, it will take time to become a kind of authority because Google will need to see you every day with a better content. After a point, they will see you as a kind of candidate. And actually, uh, there are lots of patents about this too. But uh, usually because of this situation, uh, some people or some authors might be, might be frustrated because, because of the Google, because Google is a really a patient search engine. Before choosing you, they, they really wait a long time. Sure. Well, the, what this means to me is you, you need to get that topical map created as soon as possible. You need to get writing as soon as possible, because even if, even if I created my 500 article website on apples today it's not going to rank me today it's, it's going to need some time in there to prove to google that Definitely. It's you will need to wait that's why actually my uh, in my seo case study, the traffic has increased suddenly like after three months for mm, the first three months just, it, it just turns on like a switch yes i have waited three months after that it was like i am on the game after three months the mm -hmm. game started for me very interesting which also brings me to my next question, which is, I'm sure a lot of people that are watching this are thinking, what kind of investment, both in manpower and cash, goes into this kind of approach? Or at least in your case studies, what did that look like? Actually, uh, this project was for Turkey, so it wasn't so, so much when you compare it to the euro. But uh, we have generated, like, I think it for per site, it was like, 100 article actually so uh, and every article was like uh, 1000 or between the 1000 and 2000 keywords or words sorry so you can imagine the cost actually from this point but also i must say that the length is not important 
the important thing is actually the information amount in your article, the question count and the answer count, the proper answer count. So <clears throat> usually I tell my authors that uh, write as much as possible uh, short, I mean write short as much as possible and write long uh, as much as necessary. So if you feel, if your author feel that there should be more words in this article, they can use it. So uh, it's it's not more expensive than the backlinks, to be honest. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, what uh, so about a hundred articles? Okay, I mean that's that's reasonable. I mean <clears throat> my websites are producing a hundred articles. Do you think that because you were ranking these websites in foreign niches and foreign foreign SERPs, that you only had to write a hundred articles because the competition was less? because you're not up against super authoritative sites like Healthline, et cetera, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Do Actually, you think you can, it's a you function can, of who you're up against as well. A little bit, because according to your competitors, your topical map will change. If, if there is no authoritative competitor, it means that you can create a little bit simpler uh, topical map. But if your competitor is Healthline, you will need lots of, lots of, lots of content, to be honest. And uh, in my case, actually, we had competition because there, there were lots of strong competitors in Turkey and they have lots of backlinks, lots of everything, to be honest, branding especially. They have lots of mentions. We don't have even a brand or brand name. And uh, according to the, your competitor, you will need to change your topical map and also you will need to change your uh, granularity for every content brief. Mm. It makes sense. What kind of companies hire you and can you talk about your fees? I'm sure a lot of people are just like, maybe I'll just have this guy do it for me. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, actually, I I choose the companies, to be honest, because they're, uh, usually they're, they're, there are lots of candidate uh, clients. They write usually. And I try to choose the most aggressive and ambitious ones because they are the best candidates for creating a kind of new SEO case study for me. And uh, they sometimes they have e-commerce sites, and sometimes they have a, a simple FLA sites. Or and uh, late, lately, actually, there are there is another kind of another casino, for instance. And also, there are other types of every types of actually. That's why I call my company as Holistic SEO. Sometimes they just want to work for Facebook optimization. Sometimes it's just about technical SEO. And about the fees, it changes uh, according to the project, to be honest. But uh, usually, usually it is actually more than three k. But it's not so much, to be honest, uh, for the international market. <laughs> Back it up, man. You need really good work. Um, you. Does your do your fees cover the content cost, or is that on the on the client? Uh, it's on the client, to be honest, because. Uh, after a point, uh, I, I felt I felt myself uh, like uh, human human resources, you know, because educating authors is not easy, especially for the semantic SEO. For instance, I have completed a new AB uh, SEO AB test, and I have shared that result with you actually. And you already know that actually I also use semantic sentences. So basically, I just change the sometimes if the entity types are same, like countries or streets or I don't know, people, etc. If the entity, entity type is same, the questions are same too. Just the entity name is different. And uh, to use the semantic SEO, I also use semantic sentences uh, that are processed with NLP. So in other words, every sentence is actually same for every content. Just the names are different. For instance, if I write, if I create a kind of content brief for Argentina, and also if I create a kind of content brief for England, just the questions, actually just the country names are different, and also there are a little bit localization for every country. So uh, basically, educating authors for this type of text is not easy, and because of the situation, I prefer uh, using permanent authors for the clients. Sure, sure. One one thing that I think is solid gold was in your article, you have a list, like a simple bullet point list of your best practices for authors. You want to share some of your, your top three tips for, for your authors? Yeah. 
The first one is actually never tell your opinion, please. Uh, when uh, when an author tells his opinion, actually it ma it makes me angry because I don't care about an author opinion for a topic. To be honest, I just care about the facts. Just write the facts, not not opinions. If you will write an opinion, for instance, uh, let's say that it's a kind of news and you are the journalist then okay you can write your opinion it's okay but if it is about quantum physics you don't care about your opinion please write the evidences and please you use references and write everything in a kind of definitive way because if you write entities uh, with concrete names or with concrete qualifiers google will choose all of the entities easier and also uh, just follow the sentence structure that i give because for every question i create a different types of sentence structure i tell them uh, include the ceo name include the foundation date and also include this type of information and also use these phrases or related phrases and show everything in a special or natural way so basically if an author says that I think this topic is too important. I ask her or him, how did you understand? What's your point? So I know that this is important already, but the question is doesn't ask whether this is important or not. The question says that, what is that? Just give the definition, okay? Don't, uh, don't stall me. Don't use unnecessary words. Don't use unnecessary paragraphs or anything like that. Just give the direct information. Because uh, actually, Google, what this is what Google wants actually. It wants the facts, not the opinions. That's why I always try to give more information in a direct way with more evidences and references. Got it. I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to be not blunt here, but being a writer for you sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> no, because yes, yes, actually. We have, we have some pretty strong SOPs on this is how you should write, and this is like what, how many, the word count and the amount of words of each entity, et cetera, but yours is at a next level. So yes. what kind of advice can you give to SEOs out there that are trying to find good, good writers that aren't, that can follow rules like you have and okay. are just going to actually, uh, I actually, I love working with, uh, authors who has, or who have any kind of, uh, law background or philosophy background because these people know how to think to be honest because they know how to connect things to uh, each other also mathematicians to be honest if they have this type of a background and also engineers sometimes they 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 can understand me easily but if they have a magazinal background or a little bit entertaining background they usually they fail but if they have a kind of philosophy background or any kind of law background, uh, usually they, they write really good content because they understand why I ask these questions and why I deleted that sentence from the content. <laughs> That's funny, man. Uh, I, one of my good friends is Kyle Roof, and he was a lawyer before this stuff. And he has an insane capability of reading really <laughs> boring stuff. So... <laughs> Uh, I, I, can, I can definitely see how a lawyer background would be a good writer, but they're probably not the cheapest. <laughs> for yes, sure. definitely. Definitely. Yeah, but definitely. they're going to get the job done. Um, so what's your team look like? So other than your writers, you said you had like, uh, I don't know, how many employees do you have? Like, what does the rest of your mm -hmm. team look like? Actually, uh, at the moment, I have three employees. Uh, and it's increasing, actually. Uh, the fourth one is coming and also fifth one is coming. And uh, at the moment, I try to educate them for coding, technical SEO, semantic SEO, and content marketing. And I want to give them everything, but I think I will need to be a little bit more patient <laughs> at the moment. But uh, usually, <clears throat> I actually at the moment, I am like a kind of uh, really a general manager to be honest because i manage them i audit them and also i teach them it's like actually being a kind of general mother i think because sometimes i call my employees as babies and uh, i try to educate them 
and my team is actually new i can say that and but in the future they will be better because i will explain their names with the new seo case studies i have given uh, new projects for every employee and when i publish them i will use their name for uh, honoring them or for marketing or market them also that's exciting good for you i I, th I can see you're going down the route of replicating yourself, which is a <laughs> challenging path, but if, if you can do it, then I'll power to you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Let's, let's get back to the SEO a little bit. I, I know a big part of the topical map, a big part of this equation is interlinking these pages together. <clears throat> so yes. at a high level perspective, how do you just determine whether one page should link to another in a topical <clears throat> map? Okay, the first of all, I have certain rules for interlinking to be honest because you shouldn't in, you shouldn't connect unrelated uh, entities together and also uh, there should be a kind of mutual context. If there is no mutual context, you should start to create it uh, with the with the correct question. For instance, uh, if you are talking about differences or similarities, it means that you you have something to connect each other and if there are types let's say what are the types of x it, it means that you can use interlinking for the types or stages phases and also you can use uh, interlinks for uh, any kind of attribute to be honest because every entity has different ent attributes and for instance tell me an entity protein okay protein in this context, uh, you can link the amino acids and also you can link the protein types and also you can link the uh, energy consumption a little bit because, uh, you know, there is an order uh, for the energy consumption, the first fats and carbon rice and etc. And uh, there are different attributes for the proteins because, for instance, they have nutrition and also they have a chemical formula and etc. And because of thanks to this, uh, actually, you can create lots of interlinks like essential, um, uh, essential amino acids, non essential amino acids, and etc. Uh, you need to find the right attributes to connect each other. I, I feel like it's a lot based on common sense. So we can <clears> have <throat> best protein powder linked to vegan protein powder because mm -hmm, they have mm -hmm. protein powder in common. And we yes. can have vegan protein powder linked to vegan pre-workout because they have vegan in common, right? Yes. So it's always got to have some kind of attribute or entity in common. So that yes. kind of makes sense. It's actually, about, kind of, yeah, it's actually about ontology. Uh, ontology is actually finding the mutual futures for things. It's, it means that essence of the things. Mm -hmm. So if two things have a mutual point, you can use this mutual point as an interlinking point also. Yeah. What I'm interested in is when things get crazy at scale, let's go back to this example of apples, right? Let's say I do a topical map of apples. I'm going head to head with Healthline on apples. So I mm -hmm. create a 500 page topical map. Well, everything in it is, has something to do with apples. So just should everything link to everything? That's where it gets a little bit complicated. And mm -hmm. I really wish there was a tool that would sort this out. I know in links is close, like in links can define per page. What mm -hmm. is the main entity topic of that page? Yes. So I would love a, a tool to be able to guide and say, okay, here's your website. These 15 articles are all of this topic, protein powder. So mm -hmm. link them all together. These, these three are about protein absorption. So don't link them to the protein powder because they're a different entity. Uh, yes. Keep definitely. them clustered together. I think Definitely. it's going to be next level when we get a tool to be able to do that. Definitely, actually, uh, NLP technologies can do that it, at, at some point, I guess, or I hope. Because, as you said, uh, there are lots of different contexts and every mind can see it. Because, uh, and also usually people link uh, different pages with the same anchor text and also with the same context. If you do that, you will create a kind of cannibalization and also you will create a confusion for the search engine because search engine won't be able to understand which which page is more relevant to the, this context and which page might satisfy this query more because uh, context is here and 
query of the user is here and search engine connects this query to the, this context and then it takes the source and look at the source and find the most possible relevant web page for this context too. So basically they are matching the query and the document on the context. So if you choose the context wrong and also if you use wrong, wrong anchor texts uh, for different or wrong entities, you will end up diluting the context. So as an example, let's say on my fitness site, I got a page that's supposed to be best protein powder page don't link to any other page on this website internally that has the anchor text best protein powder because you just threw off the whole plan you just confuse yes. google of which one's the right one definitely do you have definitely. any more internal anchor text rules that you follow actually i have uh to to specify the context usually i use anchor text on the heading and also i use different variations of that specific phrase on the sentences I call it animation text and then up I put the anchor text like into this point and I use this anchor text on the title of the other document. So basically I am I am showing the context in a clear way and I do the same thing here. I use the anchor text again in the tight heading. Then I use different variations of that anchor text on the animation text. I put the anchor text and I link back the other web page so basically this close or similar to content show their differences to the google and also they are differentiating their context for google clearly sure tell me if i got this right with this example so let's say you have an article on the best hosting right so my article best is about hosting. the best hosting i have a subsection called the best wordpress hosting so that's what I'll label my h2 best wordpress hosting mm -hmm. and then within this subsection in one of those paragraphs I'll have the anchor text, best WordPress hosting, and that links to a, a more detailed article on best yes. WordPress hosting. Does that sound right? Yes, and also from there, from the supplementary section, according to Google, there are two sections on the content, actually three, main content, supplementary content, and ads. And the main content is the upper section, actually. The supplementary one is at the bottom. And from the supplementary section, you can start to touch the other context a little bit, slightly. And at that point, you can link back and also you can create more content like I don't, I don't know other uh, CMSs, but maybe best free hostings or cheap hostings, etc. Mm -hmm. And you can start to link also uh, down to start to deviate from the main topic. Yeah, definitely. That's their safe spot. The and also content. you can use countries, you know, you can ask uh, for best or cheap uh, hosting for China or Baidu, I don't know. And also you can change the search engines also, best hosting for Google. I know that there is nothing like that, but let's say there is a search demand for this type of thing. And you can start to mixing the entities and you can generate new contacts for countries, for this, for search engines, or for li Linux or Windows or MacOS, or I don't know if you can write about the differences about clothes and cloud systems and most things. So there are lots of different topics there, actually. Nice, nice. But let's talk real quickly about link building. I know you didn't touch it in your case studies because you're trying to sh show off topical mm -hmm. authority. I get it. But do you build links? And if you do, what kind of links do you build? Actually, yes, I do. And I believe that if an SEO doesn't build links, uh, it's not healthy for SEO, to be honest. Uh, usually, Google tells that stay away that, uh, stay away from link building, it's not necessary or have the natural links, etc. But uh, if you don't use the links, probably you will hinder your efficiency or productivity. So basically, uh, usually at least, I use the uh, links, but uh, sometimes even, the cl even clients want to do that. And uh, I tell them, don't do it yourself, give it to me and I will do it. So uh, I have a little bit some rules about uh, link building too. For instance, I never take a link from the same source two times in six months. So let's say I have a, a link from source A. I wait six months for taking another one. And also uh, sometimes I take links for other links. Let's say I have a link for source A. I am also linking the backlink. So I am giving link to the backlink. 
And also, I usually check the sources. Let's say that the source A uh, has a negative feedback from Google for the latest updates because we know that core algorithm updates are also related to the authority and trust. So if Google doesn't trust a website, I can't use it for a reference. So basically, there are millions of sites and I can switch the source. And <clears throat> also, I don't use, I usually I don't use uh, more than one link for my source. And also, I link, comp I mention competitors. Let's say that I have five competitors. I mention them and sometimes I use their logo too, but I link myself in a natural way and also i link myself with other alternative sources and there are other lots of things to be honest uh, there there are lots of things for the link building and sometimes you have managed uh, pbs you know sometimes when you delete the links you see increase i have that kind of experience for pbs too since i start to do seo with the black hat I can't tell a negative thing about link building, to be honest. It wouldn't be honest if I would tell that link building is bad. No, link building is a good thing for SEO performance. It's, it's bad for the search engine because you are manipulating the search engine. But it's not your problem, to be honest. It's the problem of the search engine. I hope you are not angry to me <laughs> for saying you're, you're Trust me, you're on the right channel if you want to talk about <laughs> backlinks and real seo that actually works this is this is what i'm all Thank about <laughs> um, also, uh, yeah. also i have a great respect to the google spokespersons to be honest and i understand their perspective they try to help and also they try to protect their algorithm and they they try to protect their company but uh, also uh, if you tell that link building is not working or google can understand every fake link it's not true it's I wish it would, it would be true, but it's not. True, true. Um, one thing I read in your article is that you said you're not intimidated by competition. Mm -hmm. Would you put this strategy, topical authority, up into some of the hardest niches without backlinks? Like, would you go into CBD or casino just using topical authority and not touch backlinks? Actually, I will... I will try that because, as I said, uh, this is a universal factor, so it will work for every kind of industry in a way, but it might not be enough for uh, just uh, itself. For instance, this time, actually, I will use uh, navigation menu at least, <laughs> or I will use a little bit, I will use a little bit at least the pace bit optimization or technical SEO optimization and other stuff. So uh, yes, it will work, and I will try that. But also, I would support it because the competitors, uh, they really have a strong brand name and strong uh, mentions and strong backlinks, and they have years of historical data. So if you, if you are a new source and if you don't have any kind of historical data, search engine doesn't know you. So basically, you will need a little bit of support for, from the other verticals. Sure, makes, makes sense. And who knows, you could already be up against a competitor that has a topical map themselves. So yes, if, definitely. If you're, if, if you're head to head in one realm, you got to throw something else at it for sure. Definitely. Let's say a beginner wants to get started with this topical authority approach. What is the first three steps you would say to get started? Actually, uh, the first thing, uh, you should create your own topical map. And you can do it easily. And also, I think semantic SEO is not just about SEO because human beings are semantic creatures. We usually cluster similar things together. We usually associate these similar things to each other. So I think semantic SEO is a natural thing for a human being. And you, we all know how to ask questions and we all know how to find the mutual points of things on the planet or on the universe. So the first thing they should do is creating a topical map with the questions and also with the, with some other types of tools. And they can <clears throat> generate multiple topical maps. They can scrape competitors' site maps. And also they can start search for uh, <clears throat> these questions. And also they can check uh, people also ask questions because not just for scraping it, because uh, People also ask questions are switching the context according to the, your chosen question. 
if you click the first question the next questions uh, are changing according to you uh, your choose your clicks so basically you can start to think about google's own topical map because google has also a topical map and you are trying to create the best possible convenient topical map for the search engine so you will need to understand how search engine thinks besides the creating topical map then they was they at least should understand a little bit about the uh, natural language processing because for creating the uh, content briefs they will need to understand how search engine thinks because it's not just writing about the users google always says that write for the users but google might not understand the, what users understand to be honest so basically you will need to understand how a search engine thinks and how a search engine can understand a topic context or the entity or relation between the entities because you will need to understand name and named entity recognition or part of speech tags or uh, also the roles of the words for a machine and the third one is actually publishing these articles so basically create a topical map create content briefs and find your own authors and then start publishing these articles and i actually they should choose a little bit low competition area for beginning i guess because they can have better feedback from google because if search engine is satisfied by other sources a new source might not be so important for google because there are the search engine result page is already quality enough for google it means that it, it won't care about your new web page or website a little bit they they won't tell suddenly that oh okay there's a new site here and it seems it's seems working let's give it give it a ch chance it won't happen so easily because in in my case even i waited for three months for taking the first feedback from the search engine so choose a low competition area to get the quick feedbacks from the search engine makes a lot of sense man <laughs> well you. Thanks a lot for your time. This is the third time I've talked to you about this stuff. So thanks personally for giving Thank me you. so much time on this. And I'm learning every every time I talk to you. So I really appreciate that. Thank now, you. Where can people find out more about you or learn more about this stuff or follow you, etc.? Okay. Uh, actually, I am active on the Twitter and Koray Gubur is my username. And also I'm active on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, usually, I don't have enough time to answer the, all of the DMs, but I try my best. Even after the two weeks, I write an answer usually. And uh, also, a, I have a, a official website. I write my content there uh, for Python SEO and also for technical SEO, page speed or content marketing. It is holistic SEO that digital. And you can also check uh, there too. And uh, also, I have some other author profiles on on crawl and other places. They can check my articles too. Nice. We'll get it all linked up in the description. <laughs> Thank so you. So again, uh, thanks so much, brother. Take care. Thank have you. an awesome day. Thank and thanks everyone for watching as well. Thank See you. you. See you.